I am, my name's Chris. I'm a linked data person, I guess. Um, I help set up the University of Southampton Open Data Service, uh, which is a place where we provide all the data we can find from the University of Southampton that's not a secret, and we do it in RDF, and no one reads RDF, so we make spreadsheets as well. And most people actually prefer HTML pages. Um, I'm wearing shorts, so I feel the need to justify myself to people in shirts. Uh, so I've got my brag sheet of things. It says that I, my, last time I had these slides, it said I run on data AC UK. I now don't. We've handed management of that over to the GISC, which is an academic charity that is kind of administered for the country. But I was the benevolent dictator until this uh, coup of the, my leadership, which my success criteria for a project is usually it becomes so important that it's taken away from me. And I, <laughs> I'm the kind of person who gets really, really passionate about something and believes it should exist and makes it exist, and sometimes that succeeds. And the success criteria factor is pretty much it gets committee and money and things, and then I go and do something new. Okay. So this is something that comes a lot... This, this slide comes up a lot in talks I go to. I've been involved in university websites for a lot of years, and when I was preparing for this talk and I was shuffling my slides around, I was thinking business people, let's see, they care about money, not learning and things. So my normal things, I'm talking to academia, so t thinking here about how to do things. But this slide still is quite relevant. And I'm going to come back to this several times, but this is a classic problem of a website that the main reason you probably you w went to the website for this event was to check where it was. And, uh, and check, double check the data things, and it's the facts you're interested in. Once you've, the sales pitch for the conference works once. You, you, know, you might have watched the YouTube video and things, but ultimately there's two conflicting things. One is sales and the presentation and the brand, and the other one is raw data to solve my problems. So <coughs> one of the things I thought about a lot is why university or other organisations aren't providing open data. Why did I have to read on a web page the events for this? Why wasn't it a data file? And basically we've gone past the early adopter phase for open data. We're and linked data. People now know it can do things, but there's still quite a lot of fear about doing it at your organisation. It's why I asked the um, question of the chat from NASA, is the internal pr barriers of it, or oh, we've never done that before, is quite common. And when I was originally setting up our open data service, uh, we had all of these different pushbacks <laughs> to the point they became a bit um, predictable. And Generally, it's just fear of change, fear of new things, but when we were providing open data and making interlinked data from our organisation, these are, this is our bingo sheet. There's a web page that will generate this in a random order, so if you're doing an open data service, you put it up on your wall, and every time you get one, you put an X, and it, you can wind up middle managers by shouting bingo if they get a... Um, right. well, um, more recently, I gave a talk at the Open Data Institute, and... Someone asked me a question that was one of those things where I didn't know I knew things. And um, they said, well, what did you do next? So there's a little link at the top, is.gd slash od bingo, and that's the responses to this that we found worked, and some that didn't. Never tell someone who says, my data is really big, go, no, it's not. It's just, in, you emasculate them, and it's just terrible. Uh, <laughs> and then they don't like you. That was a mistake I made. I just to, uh, I'd also told a database... Uh, schema, Matt, someone who looked after one of our databases at the university, uh, she told me her database was extremely complicated and I described the schema off the top of my head from memory. That didn't actually work as a bridge building exercise. <laughs> <laughs> what works for her better, um, I found, is to explain to people that you're give, what you're giving away uh, isn't the product and there is a value in sharing data. Don't worry, I'm going to get linked data in a bit, but this is my normal open data evangelist spiel. And uh, the important thing is, if a Chinese restaurant gave away free chow mein all day, every day, to anyone who asked, they wouldn't last very long. But if a Chinese menu doesn't give away free menus, if a Chinese menu decided, or an Indian takeaway decided, that we're going to charge 10p for our menus from now on, they'd go out of business. Because um, the model is giving this data away. You give data away every day because you expect to return on it. Business cards, RSS feeds lots of other things, but it's, um, there is already a value in that, but it's understanding that you can do that at a large scale. And one of the other things is that I'm sure you guys are already fairly bought into linked data uh, as a concept. You must have some belief that it's worth at least spending a day hearing about. And I think there's several ways linked data can help. One of them is 
combining data from multiple sources that are beyond your organisation. As obviously the other speakers are talking about creating graphs of data from the information sources in your organisation. And there's a middle ground which I think is quite interesting too, which is what I call augmentation. When you've got a data set from another part that you can't change, and it could be something within your own organisation or beyond, and it's worth spending the money to create the additional data on top of that database to create what you need, but you couldn't have created it from scratch because costs would have been too high. A good example um, is if you wanted to do a database of restaurants in your city, then the really good place to start is a public database of food hygiene. The food hygiene rating scheme is a public database with both the linked data and simple download um, spreadsheets for the rest of us, and they provide the food hygiene rating for every single business that deals with food or drink in the country. This actually turns out to be quite useful for my pub, cr my pub crawl generating app as well, but um, <laughs> I've never quite finished it. It's called Booze Your Own Adventure. Um, <laughs> but um, the, um, often th th that augmentation technique I think is really important. You might have confidential information in your business, but you can use a public data set, especially a government data set, as the starting point. And I think that's something that's overlooked. The other value of that is if you then merge with another business that, or start working with another business that used that data set as its starting point as well, even if you weren't working together, your data is now far more compatible than it would be. So this is my uh, example that um, went down very well with uh, the local council, which is um, using data provided entirely by the authorities, the government and the council, to help students get to the pub better. Uh, what we did was we took the, uh, the database of the food hygiene rating scheme for the city, and we took the database of where all bus stops are, and then when a student searches for a bus, they don't search by the name of the bus stop, they can search by the name of the pub. And it will find you the nearest bus stop to that pub. And geolinking is one of the things I haven't looked into that much, we just turn out to do it, because it's one of those things you end up finding is very useful. We have lots of sets where we know the lat long of something, so we know the best bus, so we can effectively create implicit links, like these are the best bus stops for this pub, and things like that, which then can be turned into normal graph data from these things are quite near each other. Um, and again, all right, but this is my favourite one, and I'm going to hopefully show you a live version of this as well. This is uh, the open government website that gives you access to LIDAR data. The government spends a lot of money in various surveys, flying planes over the country, scanning things with lasers and finding out how high they are up across the ground. Almost all of England is covered, and it was in scattered databases, and they've now put it in one place that you can address programmatically. It's not quite as good, I wouldn't quite call it an API, you have to download zip files of a um, hundred, a hundred text files for a square ten by ten kilometres, and each one is a square kilometre, and each zip file, each text file, contains a thousand rows with a thousand numbers per row, each one being the height of a square metre of the country. It was pretty agonising to write software to get to that number, for, but um, I've now got something that can take the latitude and longitude and return me how high above sea level it is. And this is OpenStreetMap. I'm sure you've all heard of OpenStreetMap. It's Wikipedia for maps. Um, that's fairly nearby, and that's the data that you can get trivial. It's available as data as well, you can get the raw data, but this is just the tiles, and again, I've given a lat long, I can find that. That is the shape of the data, the top of the buildings, according to the government LIDAR data, so you can see the high things are white and the low things are black, and they also have the ground. And it's one of the things that this, each of these data sets, it's, you look at this and think, well, that is very hard to form knowledge out of, but when you combine them together, you can do that, and that is literally generated just from those three images you saw combined together um, with a bit of uh, prettiness to make the shadows and things. Uh, the, I'm using a very good 3D modelling system called Minecraft, uh, um, <laughs> if you're working at one metre scale, and I'm just going to take a risk and shift to this now. This is not quite graph data, but it's cool, and everyone likes pictures. You can, do you can download my software, and it will, you give it and for yourself, which I'll go into a bit more in a minute, this will be relevant, but we are here. There we go, that's where we are today. Oh, poo. <laughs> huh, sorry, how do I do this? I can't fly windows. Let's try hitting escape. And then go to this. And, oh man, I hate windows. I've just got to work out which way to go to get off the screen. There we go. So that's where we are. And 
I could zoom out in theory. This laptop is exciting. <laughs> Where's the minus button? It's about there, isn't it? Oh. Double click on the top bar and it will the screen. Thank you. I can use a computer. I'm a professional. Ah, well, yeah. So I wonder if I can zoom out with things. There we go. So there we go. And I generated that much of London. And okay, now back to PowerPoint, and it's all going to work perfectly. He says, that, not that one. That one. Then Control Enter or Controls from current slide. My mouse. Right. Okay. Right. So you can uh, download that from online, but if you just search for London Line, LiDAR and Minecraft, you can impress your kids. Um, right. So for data.southampton, uh, when I was setting it up, um, this is a thing. I've got statistics right now, which shows you how not much I don't know about statistics. Did I? Statistic. Oh, is it still wrong? Yes. Two. Damn it. Yeah, I, I don't know much about statistics, and that's one of the things. I'm not. I'm terrible at them, and I'm not. It's a metaphor. Um, so the, uh, the thing that interests me is the facts, the things that help people immediately in giving people the right information at the right time. Um, some people always talk about how many giga triples there are in their database and that more data is better. And it's like, right, well, in this database, I've got a billion triples. In this database, I've got one triple that's the date of your death. <laughs> you know, which one? Um, it's a bit like Bill Gates saying that um, measuring software by lines of code is like measuring aeroplanes by weight. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, these are the things I generally want to know when I'm going somewhere to an event like this or to another university. And um, th these are the th problems I set out to solve. Things that really matter to real people if they're me. And this comes right back to this thing that people go to, it doesn't, it doesn't say what people need to have on the website, it's what people are looking for. And I think that's important, and I think the web's taken a bit of a misstep in trying to provide data through web pages. I think we got it, we're getting it wrong here, and I'll explain why. So the, other, uh, the next part of this is about why people don't use your open data, because we produce a lot of open data, and our uh, very smart programmers at the university don't even know it's there. And what... In a management speak, there's a thing called a hygiene factor. A hygiene factor is something which doing more of it doesn't make your staff happier, but doing less of it makes your staff more unhappy. Um, for example, uh, surprisingly, pay isn't a hygiene factor. Paying your staff, um, uh, so pay is a hygiene factor. So paying your staff more doesn't make them happier. Getting a pay rise makes them happier, but paying them more overall doesn't actually increase their satisfaction at work. Giving them really, really amazing tools doesn't make them much happier, but giving them crappy tools makes them unbelievably unhappy. And so I'm interested, it's, so there's lots of things where they're making it better. It's not worth investing making it better if it's good enough. And you're better off investing that money in something that isn't good enough that's where it can make a real difference. And the same for publishing data. That this is what I was told by Sir Nigel Shadbolt, who was just Nigel Shadbolt, or Professor Shadbolt, when we first set up this service. He's a government advisor on open data, and he very much had this belief that people, if you publish the data, good things will come of it. And in my experience, that was, he meant good, but like, <laughs> what actually happens was, we're too small. We're only 5,000 staff and only 20,000 students or something like that. I can't remember the exact numbers. Uh, should be in a database. Um, but um, that's not a big enough sample size to get the same reaction you would out of government data. And even a lot of government data never gets discovered, never gets used. So I was looking at what hygiene factors were for data and why people won't use it. And I'm guilty of this as everyone else. In we have a chain with several crappy, li rusty links and one gold one that we're famous for. And every time I'm feeling secure, I go and polish our gold link in the chain rather than fix, go and replace one of the really broken ones. So I came up with this list um, earlier in the year of the things that stop people using your data as open data. And if any of them are bad, you're screwed. It doesn't matter how good the other ones are. Um, and these were the ones that I was sort of aware of that if, if I can't, yeah. If it's not actually very useful, if, if it is merely the database of pigeon weights in Manchester, that's really not valuable to many people. So there's never going to be that higher thing. And there's nothing you can do about the value of your data. All the others you can affect. The potential audience size you can affect by 
making your data compatible with data from other sources, so that if uh, so instead of making it pigeon data in Manchester, if you make it a standard pigeon data format, then it will be compatible. Then the, if someone writes an app that works in New York, it will work on your data too. So you de facto create a larger audience for it. The ease of discovery is fairly obvious. Uh, Ease of grasping the value of the data set. This is something we fall down on a lot, just making sure that people can work out that actually, as well as pigeon data, it actually shows the economic value of the city or something, you know, the, or the waste in the city or the cleanliness, and helping people understand that this data is meaningful. I just made up the pigeon one, sorry, this might get bad as an analogy, I don't know. And these exploiting the data set, one of the most criminally crap things we do is we publish data sets in, in formats like RDF without a what is RDF button. And as a community, what you should really be doing is making sure there's at least one good online reference for each thing like that, especially the geo data published by the government, which baffles me. And um, just explain, well, just a link to explain what this means and how I work with it and where I get some tools. Anytime I talk to geo data people about this, they use a word which makes me homicidal, and that is just. Oh, you just, then they say a bunch of jargon that geo people all get trained in. And um, as an amateur like me, who's just hobbying it, well, I suppose I'm a professional, but when I'm working with these kind of things, I'm an amateur. Right, and when we were looking at our own open data service uh, at the university of why, we don't, why our own IT department doesn't use our data, it turns out they don't see it very reliable. And, um, and um, so I've missed one. And this is the problem, my own blind spot. So my boss has added one. <laughs> because, um, and, I, and there's bound to be some I haven't thought of already. And it's any one of those will stop people using it. Now, there is a really interesting value in an open data service, as a linked data not, not, uh, as well, but at the moment, with all the new regulations and data protection coming in, it's going to make innovation and lightweight tasks using data in your firm, especially in the, for websites and things, much, much more expensive and problematical because the fines are getting so high if you screw up your data protection. So as a side effect of an open data service we discovered accidentally was we have this large amount of data that's already gone through the process of being cleared for use. So we don't have to do it again. So if I want, to, so if someone in, we wants to use a list of buildings from our university, they don't have to go through the formal process of getting approval to use that data. We've already approved it. It can be used by anyone in the world. It's out there under a Creative Commons uh, or a go open government license. You can just use it. You know, ISIS can use it. I think we're okay with our own finance department using it. Um, we just give a license to anyone, and I think that's a surprising thing that we hadn't expected. Right. Yeah. Right, so I've already mentioned that one. Right, so this is the thing, the auto-discovery, I can make that Minecraft map that you saw earlier, but because it's addressable online, the I can write a piece of software that can find any map tile in the world, given the latitude and longitude, thanks to OpenStreetMap. Because of this government data is now in a addressable way online, it's too big to download, you wouldn't want to, it's going to be many, many, many gigabytes, it would fill up a, your hard drive. You can't just download it, and you definitely, as a hobbyist, can't download it. But you can my, download my software from GitHub and run it, and that will generate you the street I grew up in. And that, I think that's the difference between having it available online at all and actually being able to find it programmatically. And this is what, um, very closely aligned to linked data. It's not just it existing and existing in catalogues. It's existing in a way that software can find it without having to come and ask you for help. Right, so um, Daytrace UK is something that should have existed and everyone sent around for years asking what it should do and I gave it and registered it and no one for years uh, on the theory that if it became important it would be taken off me, which it just has. Um, so, and the, the big hook for this was equipment.data. I was involved in various projects to find universities and groups of universities research equipment because we didn't know what, our biology department didn't know what the specs were for the microscopes in our uh, opt, um, electronics department. But they're in the same campus and they don't know what each other have. We're on the same team. And even all universities are ultimately rivals, but we're also on the same team in other ways. We're all funded by the same pot of money and we've all got the same uh, hopes and fears and we benefit from working together. And we were funded to, to my absolute horror, really, to go, we got a quarter of a million pounds to build a national portal of research equipment. And I was quite lucky that I managed to throw my weight around and put, use a technology that's not really been used before and insist that all the data that we published had to be open data and we would not have private agreements with the data providers. We would only take open data from them. So you can go to it. It's equipment.data.ac.uk. 
Um, I've now removed, for uh, April 1st, we uh, added Boaty McBoatface, and it was quite hard to get out again. So <laughs> it's now gone. Um, and you can search for a microscope, you can search for a wind tunnel. And when we, we did a bit of a data alignment exercise, we got a load of ex a domain experts who wanted to share equipment, and academics really like modelling data. And my God, when they were talking about, you know, aperture sizes of microscopes and things, <laughs> um, you know, wow, the, you can imagine the, di the thing. And we, um, one of my colleagues uh, is really good at this stuff, and she got everyone to do a, a consensus exercise, which involved a lot of post-it notes and working together on tables, to come up with the field, and this big list of fields is what the tables all kind of, everyone agreed, some kind of location field and some kind of description field and an, an image or a photo or a And so we boiled it down to fairly simple things from all the different ideas. And then we told everyone that they were, that they were in a hot air balloon going down over the mountains and each of these ideas was attached to a rock. And <laughs> they only could survive keeping two. And everyone voted for the two they wanted to keep. And what was powerful wasn't the one people voted for, which was largely a text description, some contact information, and uh, yeah, text description and the contact information, and that's basically it. Um, what was really powerful was the number of things no one voted for. Not one person in the room felt image was one of the top two fields. And that level of consensus building meant that we now don't get shouted at by people, because they all, all the the stakeholders saw that no one else cared either. And there's often a putting things in, in that you don't think are useful to you, but someone else might, and it turns out no one really cared. Um, so that became a standard as, as a tabular data standard, but putting it in a spreadsheet with fixed columns means it's as good as linked data. It's semantic. Oh, you can find that, and if you know that the, if you know the tabular data is conforming to a standard, then you have the semantics of what every part of that means. These are all the institutions, last time I made this slide and updated it, that currently support equipment.data. And the process, um, I'm told I shouldn't call it this because we're professionals here, so at universities we'd be calling ensuring a sustainable <laughs> service. <coughs> but that's the pretty, but it's a, you know, if it's too expensive, we can't do it. So what I wanted to do was find a way that we could keep it running with minimum human intervention because the main costs of a data, data bias like this is a human costs in keeping a relationship with each research university to know who's authorised to give us the equipment data, checking it's okay, and um, when that person moves on and their replacement comes in and emails us, checking it's not just someone who's not authorised. So you've got quite a complicated trust relationship with each organisation. We got rid of that. Um, so what we did was we said it has to be discoverable given your homepage. Like, we, all we need to know is your homepage. We already have a list of all the university's homepages, and that's all we need, and we will, you follow these instructions, and we can find it. So what you have to do, this is where we get a bit techy. We've got some data now. Everyone will be happy. Um, this is linked data. It's like a graph data. Um, so we registered with IANA, the Internet Name Authority. This is a standardized um, web address on a website. In the same way you have robots.txt, which tells the robot what to do, this is a URL on a website for an organization that gives you the open data description of that organization with metadata about that organization and links to discover further information about that organization. You can also do it with a link header in the home page. And the reason we did it like that is because some of my bitter experiences at universities. And what, what happens in universities is either the comms department want to do something or the IT department want to do something with the website, and the two don't usually play that well together. They're supposed to, but there can be a lot of, sort of it's a bit like jurisdiction in American TV show, cop shows. Um, so what we wanted was, if you control the web server, you can do a redirect, and if you control the web template, you can put it in the template. So that way, it, either route would work. And there's no, con what's interesting is, the people who've done this, there's no one or the other. I haven't got the numbers to hand, but, it's some of one and some of the other. No, there's no obvious winner. Right, so there's an example at um, Queen Mary University of London. And if you go to their website, it will be there, hopefully, still. The profile document is, does everyone know what FOF documents are? A handful. Right, FOF document was a very early piece of um, RDF spec to describe a person. It stands for friend of a friend. It described effectively someone on a social network like... Um, What's it called? Uh, Live Journal, which was uh, what the cool kids were doing at the time, which shows you how old this is. And um, it describes this is me, this is my name, I, this is my email address, and this is a link to an organisation I'm a member of. 
It's considered by many modellers as a really bad ontology, but um, it's one of the ones that was a stepping stone to getting as good ontologies, and it's still quite useful. But what we're looking at is creating, you used to create a FOF profile for yourself back when people believed uh, in distributed linked data and um, got all excited. And a FOF profile was like a home page, but in RDF, to describe things about you you wanted other people to know. The problem is no one could ever find them. Um, so there is the University of Southampton's um, OPD, which is the Organisation Profile Document, which is like a folk profile for an organisation. We describe a few things like our homepage and our phone number, and we also have this which, lot here, which is our semantic sitemap. So we say this is our events page, this is our search page, this is our freedom of information page. And working, taking some work for, that was done by some guys at Lincoln University, we turned that into an ontology of key pages in sites, not just for universities. I removed, went through and de-universityized it, so where it was it meets the VC page, it became about leader, which would cover more organisations. And that's a human readable version of what you just saw. Right, but we, the auto-discovery, yeah, I think I've explained that, I've got, I've got to go through one slide every 30 seconds according to my timing, so if I'm banging through them. Right, so I always like to get my Robert, token Robert Heinlein quote into thing. It's only a 40-minute talk, so there's one. And this is the problem with decentralised web, that deep down we all know that Facebook and Google and things like this are doing damage to the web. We would like to see distributed things, but it's just so useful. And it's easier to do the thing that we know we'd like a decentralised web. There's lots of arguments for it, but I don't use uh, alternate search engines. Why would you? And so what I'm interested in is providing a mechanism for self-interested people and organisations to still want to do the thing I want them to do. Right. So the, one of the, th the first things we did, when we started the auto-discovery, we grandfathered in a few universities very early on who um, didn't, we, just to get the site start, started, so a couple didn't have profile documents and a couple didn't have... Um, auto-discoverable profile documents, and we allowed that up to a point where we had about 10 universities, and then we were confident enough to say, from now on, this is the rule. And to get the ones who were behind to catch up, we came up with this scheme that's down the size, side, which just gives them gold, bronze, or silver. And getting to gold requires mostly someone in senior management saying, just sodding, do it. And um, it's not hard, it's not expensive, but it was a decision that no one junior would be willing to make about licenses and um, permissions and, and auto discovery. So you can see it's not hard to edit your web page to add that one link, but everyone's quite cautious about this. It's the same. The, the, you, it, and rather than convince them of the technology, which is hard, I can't do hearts and minds to IT departments or comms departments around the country, what we could do was make a senior, someone in their vice chancellor's office go, Why are we bronze? <laughs> And um, this has worked very well. <laughs> and a lot of places, can't, we're, we're, now, we're announcing we've now gone gold. It's the kind of thing people like to go from bronze to silver to gold. And it's a uh, basic manipulation of um, knowing what senior management care about, but it worked. And um, so this, is, and this was the thing, that um, for bronze, it, um, you just had to have it in a format we could read online. Just, and we accept RDF and we accept uh, spreadsheets of all kinds, so we basically accept any um, tabular data that has our headings in. The, if it's described by an OPD, it got silver, and if it was auto-discoverable and had an open license, we gave it gold. But the auto-discoverable and the open license really needs someone very senior to say, fine. Um, what, one of the things, um, other things we did, which was, um, again, manipulative, sneaky, that's what you've got to do in this one, was um, our, all our examples put the data in the public domain with a note to say change it if you don't want your data to be public domain. And of course everyone's lazy and just cut and pastes. So, so University of Cambridge's equipment data is public domain. So if, you're worried, if someone else is worried about putting it in the public domain, you go, look, University of Cambridge do it. And, ten, and then five years from now, when someone at University of Cambridge goes, my God, we're public domain, that isn't right, should we change it? That's why everyone asked us. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it's a surprising amount of um, psychology and manipulation required in... Um, but how did they get them to be public domain in the first place? Well, they just cut... Well, they said it's public domain and they cut and pasted it. They cut and pasted the licence. <laughs> so they, uh, if they didn't make an informed decision... Uh, and to be honest, more importantly, 
It will cause no harm for it to be in the public domain. Now anyone in the world can freely reuse the University of Cambridge's list of research equipment without purchasing the University of Cambridge. <laughs> so what? They can anyway, it's just now the University of St. Cambridge can't see them, which that wouldn't have happened anyway, so it just makes everyone's lives easier. But I make it public domain. I like what's called, what I call a pr please attribute license. It's like a must attribute license, but if you're combining data from a thousand sources and each one of those is please attribute, you now have to attribute a thousand sources and that would be very difficult to do on a, very, on a, on a mobile phone screen. So most people will attribute anyway out of courtesy and if they won't get to attribute because of your license, they aren't anyway. So frankly, I think it's describing what you meant and rather than putting an actual obligation on someone. Um, the final one is one I missed. We, I, we did toy with going adding platinum because I should have said every item has a unique ID within your organisation that will never be used for anything else within your organisation. Preferably a URI, but I'll take equipment one as an ID. Didn't do that, should have done. Okay, so I have a word for this strategy, which is my Trojan horse strategy, where people bring this technology. I didn't explain to them that auto-discoverable open data, linked data, was going to be a big deal in lots of ways which they could use for other things. I just said, oh, that's a way to find your equipment data cheaply. And we didn't oversell it when we were getting universities to do it, because it makes people nervous. And when they put it behind their enemy lines, they can serve a... <laughs> it's, not, it's not full of evil soldiers, it's actually full of candy. And I didn't want to... <laughs> I didn't want to scare people by quite how powerful this potentially is. A lot of this was actually inspired by a friend of mine who said I should give up on your eyes. That basically what identifies an organisation or anything really is its homepage. Every organisation, every big event has a homepage. That's the ID that your mum can find. Or sorry, I shouldn't say your mum anymore. We, um, this was a problem that was raised recently. Your mum is, no long, is not an acceptable, incompetent technical person. Um, a lot of people's mums are quite good at RDF these days. So um, we, we, we actually invented a, um, a chap called Rube, who's like um, Alice and Bob in um, sort of internet security. And Rube is a really nice guy, senior at the company, boss's best man at his wedding. Everyone loves Rube, buys drinks for all the developers will give his password to anyone who asks nicely. Um, so anytime he's like, so Rube, yeah, you, know, you want something Rube can do, and he can at least go find the web page of the company you're talking about, and that should be enough to identify it and find data about it and link, and link that data. So we haven't done enough as much as I dreamed of yet, but I'm going to try another live demo, so bear with me. How am I for time? Good question. Uh, who's... <laughs> I'm so enthralled by it. <laughs> That's a good start. Right, where's the actual... Oh, it's over. I think it's still going. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So, right now... Where's the mouse? There, okay. So, you can find all this stuff in the real world at opd.data.ac.uk, which is the bit of the open data service, the national open data things I wouldn't give up. So, we're just have had the rest. We're holding on to this for now because it, it's my baby and I'm not ready to let it go out dating yet. The night, well, the really nice thing about the equipment data service as well is if you don't like it, you can make your own. All the code's on GitHub. All you need is a list of home pages of sites you want to create equipment data from, and it will find it for you. So I really believe in this decentralized approach. An unnecessary hub is just stupid. Right, so this is the site, and we compile, we, we compile OPD documents from academia in the UK. And, the, and we have a list of all the home pages of everything under AC UK, which we've got access to the DNS, and we crawl that, just, just the home pages, and collate what we find. Those are the organisations currently supporting it. There's some respectable ones there. We haven't got broken out of academia yet, but there's no reason this technology won't work for creating li lo the long tail of linked data from any kind of organisation. Uh, so, the, um, where, it, where people have followed all the instructions because it was too easy. When they actually did it, they it took loads of politics to be allowed to do it, then they just had to do one like a very short turtle file. So most of them got carried away and go through the entire documentation of the site and do all the optional bits, including the semantic site map, so they mark up all the pages. That was, means I can get a list of the events pages for each, organ for each participating organisation. There we go, there's a list of events pages at each organisation that's specified by them, so that is Self, what they have self-certified as their current events page. And uh, this is very different to guessing its event page. We've also got what they've self-certified is their... Now, how, oh, I can't use Windows. OK. <laughs> uh, oops, now that's my graph. OK, we've also got a list of their Facebook, their Twitter, and other social media. And this is things that they have certified, not things that... Um, 
we've discovered, uh, used learning or guessing. Guessing the, um, oh, I'm going to give up on this. Um, guessing the, um, how do I get back to PowerPoint? Right, guessing the Twitter account is something we've tried to do by crawling websites. And it turns out that when people link to Twitter, they quote, they have tweets, and the tweets link to other people tweeting. So you can't easily tell which is the Twitter account without actually looking at their site many times over many weeks and getting the only Twitter account that's consistently linked. Um, right, so the problem with getting businesses to do this and making things that join up between businesses or any organisation, well, it's, uh, we, it's what we call the not invented here problem, that, if you, um, that everyone wants to design their own thing. And, um, yeah... Unfortunately, Lego would work well together, but the real, like, people tend to go off and go, oh, that's really great, an interoperable system. I want to make an interoperable system too. <laughs> so I'm going to mix my metaphors now. I realised when I was skimming through these slides that um, what we need to do is look more for how to make the railways line up. And it's hard to ensure that um, people from different organisations create things that can be joined up. And it, the biggest problem is it means the tools can't be reused. One of the usual... The usual developer approach, which is um, what Henry Ford would call faster horses as opposed to a motor car, is to write things to convert from every format to every other format, which is not necessarily good, because the more f uh, that gets out of hand very fast, you need very skilled people to create them, and you need to be, need to be able to discover these solutions. Um, this, is the free this is a 3D printer model you can download for joining up your stickle bricks to your Lego to everything else. And they're very careful about checking the, the patents so that they only put things... They've got a couple of things that designed that will get released in a year when that patent ends. Um, so they can't put those model things out yet. And this is the free universal construction kit, which I can't put an acronym up for obvious reasons. Um. <laughs> there we go, slow boat. <laughs> Yeah, and so, yeah, putting... Uh, I tend to write a lot of stuff and put it on GitHub, but that's not good enough. That doesn't solve the problem for the next person who's trying to find it. They won't even know how to find these tools. And so the problems are getting solved again and again. And I think what we need to do more is look at what things do we have in common. And every organisation has... Or most organisations have certain things in common. Research organisations generally have research publications. Teaching organisations have courses. Um, m many, many businesses have a product catalogue. Those things have prices. They're available from a place. They, they have offers to people. And these structures are standardised. There are other categories for this. For example, Good Relations, uh, FOF, all the, the organisation ontology. And that's not enough. One of the things that is lacking and W3C are beginning to think about, that's the World Wide Web Consortium, is what's called application profiles, which is not just taking the model, uh, not just taking a vocabulary, but saying how to use a vo that vocabulary to conform to this model. So it's the difference between, um, well, it's a geo thing, so it must have a lat and long, to existing, if you put a lat, you must also put a, put a long. And if you describe a postcode in the UK, please do it like this. And some things, like events and publications, are fairly well um, documented for things like that, and other ones, people are still forming consensus, and I th there's not enough demand for them yet, but I think, I'm hoping that will grow so the web doesn't suck. Um, all right, this is our enemy. All of us are, the, and this is, oh, sorry, this is all of us, um, this was from a blog post I wrote a few years ago after a particularly vexatious conversation with a professor at a university, not ours, and... Um, in, this, uh, in my blog post, there's a vill Batman is fighting a, uh, a villain called the Modeler, and Batman's really, really screwed over by this because he can't work out if he needs one, identi one URI or to, for him, or one for Bruce Wayne and one for Batman, and whether they're the same as or not. And um, it's basically uh, the point of all of that is actually that um, it, do it depends on what your do application is to how you model the data. And people think, and there's a danger of thinking there's a perfect model. There isn't a perfect model. The only perfect model of things is reality. So other than that, you are basically making compromises, you make different compromises for different reasons, and so linked data, you can sometimes get linked data that just doesn't join up. I mean, imagine if you took lots of different superheroes, like Loki, um, like, and characters like Loki and Iron Man, and put them in one movie, it wouldn't make sense. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Linked data can be an awful lot like comics. And trying, you can join up any two Batman. You can join Batman with any one story, but if you try and make it all make sense at once, it will fall apart because the internal logic doesn't work. So there's still work to be done in uh, as an open data community agreeing these standards. 
And yeah, the overmodeling, I love our overmodeling. I love getting a whiteboard and designing an ontology from scratch. The last big one I did was for portals. Uh, things which allow you to move between um, being inside things. <laughs> so doors and um, entrances to, uh, to buildings and all these other things. Uh, and I spent ages modeling it because we just needed it for our thing and no one has done it before. And it's, um, I love doing this so much, but most of the time it's better to come up and reuse something someone else has done, even if it's worse, because a million people doing things wrong together is actually usually more useful than a million people doing things right individually. <laughs> so this is what we published for creating the profile documents, and <coughs> we literally didn't explain it was Turtle. We just said, here's how to do it. Because one of my ambitions for linked data and open data has been, always been that I want those arses who 15 years ago were writing broken RSS feeds that didn't pass properly and writing terrible, terrible RSS readers, but eventually that kind of work together-ish. I want them writing RDF. I want the long tail of people writing, being able to write and share data, not just the experts. That's the problem at the moment. It's too hard. I want it to be open to everyone. So this... You just need to, you, at the top of the document, explain how to decide what your URI is, and you, and you know what your Facebook account name is, so you just fill that out. You put it into an online checker, and it goes, yeah, this is your Facebook account, right? And you go, I've got that right. My most proud moment started as a bit of a head hitting the desk, and then I realized it was awesome, which is when one university uh, was doing this, and they've got a good computer science department at that university, but they weren't the ones doing it. The people doing it were the research office. So there's some poor secretary or administrator who's trying to do this, because they need to, and they care. It's not because they believe in open data or linked data. They just want their equipment data on our site. And they couldn't work out what they'd done wrong. They got a few errors in the turtle. They'd made a few typos. But the checker wasn't even telling them that because they'd done it in Word. And they hadn't understood they needed to do it in a text file. And that's who I'm aiming at. This is people who don't care and don't understand and just want to get the value out of it. And that's, I think, really important. I'm very proud of that. So... Finishing back where we started, I think as the web we've got this wrong, I think this, is, I put, this should be discoverable, standardised, open data. When you come to an event like this, the timetable, the location, and the programme should have been available on this site as a standardised RDF document my phone can read and know about. The fact that it's not is just people don't understand how bad the web is and how good it could be. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, well, we're suitably chastised, so <laughs> we'll make sure next time there is. Um, anybody got any questions? That was fascinating. For a commercial organisation like many people here, what would be the driving force to put more data into public domain? Right, so the question here is what would be the driving force for a commercial organisation to put data into the public domain? And it, there's certain data that you benefit what, from having other people share. For example, uh, your list of job, um, job vacancies, there is no reason to put a license restriction, in my opinion, I'm not a lawyer, on um, the, if you publish a job advert, I see no value in <coughs> putting a license on that. You're allowing, if you're allowing, you want people to republish that, you benefit from people republishing that. For most organisations, your product catalogue, you benefit from other organisations having a copy of your product catalogue and letting people find your products. If, you don't, if people can't find your products, that's a problem. In the same way that um, as a, if you're a plumber, your existence, your phone number, and the fact you're a plumber in um, Gwent, you want as many people as possible in the world to know this is the phone number of a plumber in Gwent. So you benefit from sharing the data. So the less restrictions you put on it, the more likely it is to happen. Hello. Um, during your presentation, I have to say that a lot of the things that you talked about, the sort of auto-discovery, you know, distributed systems, these kind of things, something that we, we've also tried to uh, tried to go with as well. But I was, I kept thinking about schema.org mm -hmm. when you were referring to a lot of things that you've done, and I wonder whether you consider that. So, for example, Eventbrite, I believe, does publish uh, schema.org metadata about the events, and so some of those things that you mentioned are in fact available as as RDF in some form. Right. The, the problem with schema.org is that it's very, very good if you're Google. 
And um, there's a brilliant guy called Dan Brinkley in London who's done a lot of work on it. And schema.org does solve a lot of these problems. And I think what it, it actually does provide some of the patterns that we should be using and just need to start doing it. The problem is w embedding metadata in web pages only works if you have a data center and can crawl the websites. <coughs> what I'm interested in is how um, a PhD student or an, a hobbyist programmer could discover that, could discover that data. And for Eventbrite, the individual event page is probably going to be discoverable. But um, for your, for, um, for your organisation, but if I was coming to the website for this conference, and I just have the URL of this conference, I can, cannot write a piece of software to reliably find me the um, venue of this conference yet. What, um, even if it's embedded in the... Um, what I'm interested in is how you could get all of the information available and be confident you've had all of it. If you come to the University of Southampton, we've got a site called events.sotten.ac.uk with all our public events in, which is a monstrous back-end that crawls 80 RSS feeds. Um, but um, that is a complete list of all the events we have in our index. Whereas if you go to a page, you only know that one event. And to know you've got the complete list is impossible through schema.org because there's no way to get... If you wanted to say, give me... I want to find this at the University of Southampton, you can potentially do that, but if you want to say, give me all the buildings, or I want to know actual data sets, schema.org, embedded in pages doesn't work, but the description of schema.org, the actual description of events, of people, of organisations is excellent, and it's a very good candidate for using in this, because you can just use it in RDF documents as well. Have we got any quick, quick questions? We're, we're probably 10, 15 minutes behind schedule, which I apologies. If I if I was Google, what I would do is I would come up with a version of this that's slightly better, but how Google wanted that doesn't touch that, uh, which is effectively schema.org. And um, this the problem with this from Google's perspective is that it allows anyone to use the data without a broker. And I'm hoping that I can get enough people doing this and getting it, uh, the expectation of this as a peer-to-peer -peer system before Google or whoever just steamroller it and kill it. Because that's what I'd do if I were them. Um, so. Because for, for, for ordinary people, um, it, it seems like you, you just cannot buy power. Because you know, if you buy power, you have to pay Right, well, so you can do, it's not mutually exclusive, you can do both, and there's still benefits to using things like schema.org to benefit your Google search. What I'm, um, what I'm doing at the moment is trying to set something up um, that UK, the UK research universities seem like a really, that's my home turf, and it seemed a good place to try and get this seeded, and part of it is to make it so that... Uh, Universities have to do this. It's quite likely they'll end up being forced to do auto-discoverable equipment data as part of their funding to get equipment data, which they really like, uh, which they're getting, not going to say no to because it's it's very easy and, it get, and it's a large amount of their income, uh, millions and millions of pounds. So what my plan was to make universities do it and show it works, and then. What about, some, what about equipment uh, like the one that uh, Google bought over in America, like quantum leap, no, quantum wave. Uh, it's, it's a kind of big, it's a type of server, and it's, uh, it's not actually quantum, but it has the all the capability of quantum. And they bought over this uh, in, in America, and they, 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 um, they're hoping that that will be the next day. That's the thing for them to do. Yeah, and I mean, that, that is a challenge. Well, the, the main thing that I've done is try to learn from history and learn from the history of the development of the web. And so I can't control this. You can go and download this. You can go and write from scratch a piece of software, give it a list of, uh, you, give it a list of university homepages and build an equipment database like mine. And I can't stop you. And I think that's the important thing. You can invent new bits for the organisation. It's just a turtle document. You can come up with new things to add to that, and I can't stop you. And I wanted something that doesn't have a central authority because that's the best way I could think of to... Uh, to get it to take off before something steamrolls it. So I've got 42 organisations implementing it. You can see it working. We're talking to the um, government departments, but that's all 
being remixed again, but um, it's because there's lots of value in this for people reporting statutory information. For example, um, freedom of information statements was one of the things we've, I had, to, had an informal chat with freedom of information officer, commissioner's office, whatever it's called, they've changed it again. But the idea was that organisations could actually use that to state what their freedom of information document page was, and that could be then discoverable and authoritative. And there's lots, and I think it's really valuable for that. We're talking the Higher Education Statistics Agency, because they collect up statistics from universities, and much of it has to be fact-checked because it's making sure we're not cooking the books. But there's lots of information the university can self-certify. Uh, of contact information, um, key service information, the link to the way the link to information for disabled students, for example, is something I can certify from my university. They don't need to check that because we're the ones who suffer if it's wrong. And so, as a way to get authoritative information between organisations without having to have a formal, expensive business relationship, I think it's really. I think that's where a lot there's a lot of potential as well. Okay, that's that's great, Chris. Thanks a lot. And. Uh, Breathe. <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed that. Thanks a lot, Chris. <laughs>